Okay, so we are really reaching the end of the Zero Knowledge Summit. This is something, this, what we're gonna do here is called a park bench panel. It's something that I do every summit. I'm gonna explain how it works. So we have our starting panelists. I have a question. I'm gonna ask a question, they're gonna answer the question, and then I actually throw it out to all of you. If you have an idea, a comment, a question, something from any time today, like any topic, put up your hand, I'll call on you, and then you can ask the question. If it's a question, the panelists will answer. If there's an opinion in the question, you're gonna take one of the seats of the panelists. And so this is a rotating panel. You got it? Oh, are you right under the vent? <laughs> okay. Wow, oh, this is a really, oh, we're really torn here. All right. Um, Tux gave me a very nice opening question, which was, what is your cryptography wish list? And actually, can you guys move a little closer to each other? This is weird. <laughs> hey, George, yes, you won't be here long. You have Don't a worry. hoodie, so. <laughs> All right. Cryptography wish list, the thing you wish already existed. Um, I guess constant time snarks would be nice or, or, something, or, 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 or something that's extremely efficient. So that, let's just say that, that you, you can't do better than native compute. So, so native compute parodied uh, snark performance for proving. All right, pass him the mic. Uh, maybe not cryptography wish list. Generally, I would like like to have more flexibility to verify cryptography on the Ethereum virtual machine. So I would say um, snore on Bitcoin, and also malicious, secure, two-party computation with low uh, computational complexity. When you say snore on Bitcoin, is that a... Deployed on Bitcoin. Is that a pipe dream, or is that a... <laughs> It's a I wish guess. list. Yeah. All right. Um, I want to throw the question out to the audience, or I want to actually ask the audience for. So the mic is right there. Oh. The mic is there. Wait, Jacob, I need your attention. Yeah. So the mic is right there. Um, I need you to put up your hand if you have any comments, questions, ideas, anything you want to ask these panelists or say. All right. We got a question. We, got, we actually got a question right here. Uh, so, I was told to share my uh, opin my answer to the cryptography <laughs> wish list. <laughs> Damn, blowing the cover. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my wish list is that I'd like to see a lot of more interesting uh, constructions based on lattices. I really like a lot of interesting stuff that's coming from lattice-based cryptography, and lattices are particularly interesting because of just how of all the many things they can do. And I would really like to see uh, more research into lattice-based zero-knowledge proofs, uh, efficiencies for uh, Im improvements on just lattice-based constructions and things like that. Um, I think they're kind of cool and can be cool. important. Do you want, so you're going to take a spot, but maybe do you also have a question or anything you'd put towards everyone um, here? Yeah, actually. Um, so given like everything that we all have seen today with like zero-knowledge proofs, like what was the most exciting thing you saw today that you're like, oh, shit, that's cool? Like, anything stick out from all, all right. the talks? So he made an, he, Howard, you're out. So you're going to give up your seat. Um, leave the mic with Georgius or someone. And you're going to take the spot. Perfect. And Georgius, do you want to answer that question? Uh, for me, probably it was Halo, because uh, actually I haven't read like any of the documents that uh, specified, so it was like all completely new to me. And I think it's cool like if you're able to do. My understanding from Halo was like it allows you to do pairings like in a way without having like without requiring a pairing curve. Um, I think that's correct. So if that's true, like uh, I think it's huge. Cool. What about you, Ayo? So. Um, a lot of them were great for me, uh, but Marlin probably oh. uh, was was uh, the one that I, that I enjoyed. Why was that? Why was it interesting? I guess just the uh, the cryptographic compiler aspect of it, or building towards that, and having something that can uh, combine like different types of proofs and uh, uh, polynomial commitments uh, cool. to produce you know the snarks with different properties. I think that's a very interesting uh, direction. All right. Are there any questions or any comments from the audience? 
There was a who had a hand before. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to the wish list. I want short post quantum signatures, and lattices are not the way to do that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, you're, you're right. I just think lattices are cool, man. All right, Calm so down. I think there's, there's an opinion in there. <laughs> Georgios, you're off. Alan, you're on. So do you guys... Uh, Wait, this seems like a discussion. Why, why did you agree. actually say it was awesome, then? Because lattices offer, like, a lot of interesting properties. Like, post-quantum... You, you want a short uh, post-quantum signature. Yeah, lattices aren't going to do that, no. <laughs> yeah, no, but there's, like, some cool stuff that lattices... Like, fully homomorphic encryption, you know? There's, it's different, different use cases. I just like lattices. They're uh, intellectually stimulating, mathematically stimulating. I think they're cool. Like, you agree probably, right? Well, all the branches of mathematics for post-quantum cryptography are intellectually stimulating. Why prefer lattices over the others? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're politicizing my answer. <laughs> um, I like lattices. I think they're cool. That's... I don't know. I don't. I don't favor them in the in the PQC or anything. I, you know, I just, I just think they're kind of cool and they have a lot of interesting properties. And I'd like to see more research in lattices. Does anyone else have any opinions or thoughts about lattices? <laughs> Can we just respect how nerdy that is? <laughs> Does anybody have any thoughts or opinions on lattices? <laughs> All right, so have strong feelings, I'm going to ask chance. a different question, which is more about um, post... Oh, just be careful putting the camera there because there might be people running around you. Um, Post-quantum. You just mentioned that. Do we have to care? Yes! No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What she well. said. <laughs> a actually, if, if there's a way to <laughs> update your signature scheme... Um, when quantum computers arrive, you can get away with using pre-quantum signatures until that point. What you cannot get away with is encryption, because if you encrypt a, a plain text now, it can be stored indefinitely and decrypted by quantum computers when they arrive. Mm. But you can get away with postponing the adoption of post-quantum signature schemes. By the way, you can put up your hand at any time, not only when I ask a question. If you are thinking something, you are welcome to do that. So you say we should be worried or we should not be worried? I think uh, it's not as dramatic as some people uh, hint. Okay. You say... I agree with that one. So very balanced. Yeah. <laughs> I would also agree no, with that. We need, we need, who said no? Well, <laughs> I know that person. That's Deirdre. Oh. <laughs> oh, wait. So, wait. No, she said yes. Yeah. Who said, said no? no? Zach? Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, my take on low noise quantum computers is they are a thing that, like, the same civilizations that, like, engineer event horizons of black holes do and not things that like we have to worry about. Like if you can build a low noise large quantum computer, you can probably like laze a star and kill me. All can right. you prove it? <laughs> that sounds like an opinion. I owe you're off. I, you're I would would challenge that opinion <laughs> and say that if you assign a probability of I don't know, two to the minus sixty to the construction of large scale noise free quantum computers within the next 10 years, then you could not possibly claim that any RSA crypto system has a security level of 2 to the minus 128, or 2 to the 128. Yeah, I think I'm claiming that the probability of a, quantum, of a low noise quantum computer in my lifetime is lower than that. Ooh. <laughs> that, that's a By the way, hands can go up at any time. <laughs> You can keep keep going. Oh, I, I yeah, I think it's a strong claim that we won't see. I mean, there's some. I've heard both sides. I've heard you know people, uh, specifically a team a team well, member of on, mine. Hold on, just like, have you ever met someone whose job it, it doesn't depend on this possibility? Who claims that like you can build a quantum computer? <laughs> 
so, our lifetime. So the, the problem <laughs> the problem is that that's that's great. It's like okay, that's great critical thinking, and I would agree. The problem is is that as Alan pointed out here is that it is a non zero chance that if this happens that it's going to cause so many problems and we're kind if you're like a huge if if you're the government you know or if you're somebody who want or who cares about con, uh, storing all this information all this private and keeping it all private you have to include uh, you know the the a quantum future in your threat model at some point and even if it's not going to be here in a hundred years you know we don't it's, it's still important. Okay, we're gonna let somebody in the audience make a point here. Hi, sorry. I have a question about uh, application. I wanna know about the low hanging fruits of what we can do to make money w with this now. So I was thinking like, uh, oh, money yeah, make I wanna money make money with it now. And um, so I was thinking like, for example, for zero knowledge and um, like credit reporting companies like Experian or TransUnion, yeah. that seems to be a low hanging fruit for zero knowledge or Swiss bank kind of things. So what do we, th is that an opinion? No, it's a question. What are some <laughs> good low hanging fruit things that could benefit already to today it? from um, zero okay. knowledge kind of fruits? We're gonna leave it as a question, fair enough. You get to stay there and you guys can try to answer it. I'd say that um, this day and age, a lot of people are enthusiastic about this thing called democracy. I have no idea why, <laughs> but if you're going to have a vote, it's possible to prove that the tally was correct and still guarantee that the votes remain confidential. And I think that's, it doesn't even require very complicated zero knowledge proofs. And in fact, uh, over at Microsoft, they're, they're developing this cryptographic voting system that is designed to have very easy to understand zero knowledge proofs such that high school students can actually write a verifier for the voting system. I like that as a, a low-hanging fruit both for, for practice and for outreach. And, uh, oh, sorry. Well, so you were asking about the, the sort of like uh, credit reporting th stuff. And I would say that everybody who's tried to introduce like advanced cryptography into like conventional like underwriting um, has like run into a brick wall. Um, but we are sort of sort of clearly close to like a bunch of systems um, where like you need where it's like nice to be able to make like especially short term like loan risk decisions like I loan you something to some money to open a payment channel in layer two um, and I'm exposed to risk for you know some number of blocks um, and it would be cool to introduce some sort of zero knowledge proof based uh, underwriting scheme into systems like that. And I think there's probably money to be made there. Yeah, do you have a thought? I'm also interested, I think, in zero knowledge voting. So like what Alan was talking about, I think is, is really interesting. Um, I'm not really in support of the banking system. So if you make money for those people, I'd, it's just abolish the state instead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we have a question over here. Actually, it's, an, it's explicitly not a question. Okay. But um, I, and, and then really, Henry uh, is, is patiently over there, and, and, I, and I'm sure uh, Henry will have something very interesting to say. But just in reference to uh, this voting thing, well, first of all, of course, the correct question, or the, you know, one should ask not about making money, but uh, how can we better the world with uh, this technology? But uh, with respect to voting in particular, it's a plug. If you want to learn how to implement w such a, a scheme, um, we're doing a workshop on <laughs> Wednesday. Uh, oh, I forgot if there's rules on uh, plugs. Go ahead. With 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 uh, Ethereum Foundation, I, Vitalik will also be giving giving a talk, and the end goal will be at the end you sh you will have implemented such a such a such a voting scheme using Snarks. Hmm. That's it. All right. Is there an opinion in there? Are you coming up? Come up. Mm. I think you're I'm up. okay. Thank you. No, no, you got to come up. Isaac. You can plug it again. Actually deploying e-voting like that is a terrible idea. I think it's a great research area, but do not, for the love of anything, deploy that. Okay, you're, you made an, you're an opinion. You get up here. Can I, can you I can't respond? both say no. You can respond. I agree. E-voting is terrible. Um, however, uh, yeah, I don't think that, I, I, I was more in lines of like voting for like unions and striking. That would be really cool. 
anonymous unions, decentralized <laughs> autonomous <laughs> unions. Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I think that sounds like a, I like that idea. <laughs> All right. There's a question over here. All right, um, so uh, sort of having like a flashback to the 90s and the first episode of Crypto Wars, um, <laughs> you had uh, a situation where people said like, oh, well, you know, we can make these kind of compromises on encryption and we'll have like, for instance, export cipher suites and this is the way by making this reasonable compromise, we can like protect the viability of encryption and then what happened you know over the next 10 20 years was uh, that those uh, design decisions caused like 20 years of exploits in TLS and so my question is what are the compromises on privacy that are being made today in blockchains that will be haunting the world for the next two decades Wow that's a really good opinion I think you have a seat. <laughs> come up. It was it was come phrased up, as a come question. Up, come up. Give him the, give him the mic. So there's like a flip side to that question. It's like, <laughs> how, will soundness questions about your zkp system haunt the global financial system for the next 20 years? Which is the other the flip side of where we are right now. <laughs> All right. Um, any other thoughts on that? No. Any other questions out here? If not, I'm going back to quantum. Should I'll I? just keep trolling the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so actually, let's, let's go back to that because that was sort of lively and not everyone got to weigh in on that. What do you think? Should we worry about quantum computers or not? I'm going back there. I think yes, theoretically. I think in principle, again, there is a lot of sort of lower hanging fruit we should probably worry about more in practice. But I mean, in the long run, why not hedge against it? Sure, there's that risk. It's an interesting problem to study. Go for it. Yeah. Henry? Uh, Realistically speaking, you probably have some stupid mistake in your like implementation of digital and signatures. That's what's and that's what's going to screw you, right? Like. Uh, ditto. All right, we need, uh, we need a couple more questions going, okay. That's how it works, people. Keep your hand, keep thinking of things, put your hands uh, up. So similar to voting, I guess, or maybe not, but with like MPC and like modern sort of threshold cryptography, threshold signatures in particular, and wallets implementing these kind of things, exchanges, this kind of stuff, what's your view on like that space at large and, and the security of those schemes as well as actually like deploying them in practice? Hmm. So, my understanding is that in, in principle it can be done it can be done quite well. The problem again is just that you, you get more and more complex things you need to implement correctly and it's easy to make mistakes and I think there were some very critical mistakes and some implementations of uh, threshold um, ECDSA schemes that are on GitHub, so you know, be careful. Mm. But in principle I think it's it's uh, it would be nice to have sort of reliable implementations that people can build on. Because I think many people kind of assume this as a building block for various things, but then if you look at sort of what's out there as code you can use today, there's not that much good stuff that's uh, battle tested. Unlike, say, you know, a signature library where you just go pick something and you're good. Yeah. My impression of the MPC space is it's kind of like the zero knowledge proof space before Zcash, which is there's been a lot of academic work, mm. but like there hasn't been a good feedback loop between like practical implementations and the academic work. So what the academics work on probably has nothing to do with what would actually be useful in industry. Um, I and I would actually disagree with you. There's like some like real world non-blockchain MPC things out there. Yeah, like it's the like satellite project. No, there's this like Dutch potato auction or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> the that beet, is like the always what beets, gets pointed. The, the sugar, sugar beets. beets. Sugar beets. <laughs> Estonia something something. <laughs> There's like no feedback loop. There's like three things. Yeah, <laughs> and so like what happened with Zcash was it like created that feedback loop between the zero knowledge proof community and yeah. like academic community and like industry and like has led to what we see here and like 
that needs to happen for NPCs. But wasn't like the trusted setup was an NPC, so wasn't that also some sort of feedback loop? And like it's the a fact very that a universal trusted setup. It's now. a very constrained NPC. So so is Threshold DCDSA. Uh, what we're doing with the setup for the um, Ethereum 2.0 verifiable delay function, like RSA modules, is probably like the biggest and most high value use of like very like traditional NPC ever. Huh. And it'll be interesting to see if it like completely falls over. No thoughts. Right. need to be replaced soon. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm potentially asking a very noob question here. Uh, can you guys talk about like uh, the relationship between formal verification versus the um, the zero knowledge proof? Because my understanding is without well, I mean, this is mostly a question, but uh, I mean, without formal verification, you can't be sure that whatever you commit to is actually what you want. Yeah. And then, you know, how do you guarantee the soundness of that? So it's like a purpose design question for you. Um, I think that's <laughs> true even with formal verification. Uh, I think that e even if you have some kind of formal verification, you still have no way of being absolutely sure that what you're proving is what you want because you'll always have this problem of, okay, I've made this formal model, and does that formal model actually correspond to uh, the behavior that I intuitively expect? Because all, all of these systems that are people are building are ultimately uh, systems of interaction between people. Right. And so unless you have a way to, uh, this isn't saying, this isn't a kind of like nihilist view that like nothing, no improvements are possible, but just that you know, attaining kind of perfect security is not really possible unless you define your security goal to be lower than the kind of human interactions with the system. So, I mean, I guess uh, my follow-up question would be, do you think there will be requirement for formal verification for any sort of ZKP system or do there, so there should, should not be any? Or there's like two layers of this problem. One problem is the layer of is your proof system sound and then is your implementation of your proof system what the paper says um, and then the second layer of the system is like we had we talk about these circuits and these polynomials but we don't talk about where they come from and whether right. or not they represent the protocols right. that like we think they do and we still don't we also don't we have there's a lot of like lack of verifiability there exactly yeah. all right okay. thank you so we like lots of work to be done like these things can all be improved a lot. I would maybe add that I have the impression that in the blockchain space, formal verification has kind of become this check mark thing yeah. you want on whatever you do and people <laughs> end up with very, shall we say, generous or charitable interpretations of what it means for your thing, whatever it is to be formally verified and that's a bit of a problem. Um, yeah. Because the, the, the statements you're making are just very complex. It's hard to break down to saying, it's formally verified check mark, right? Like, what did you actually formally verify? Like, does that correspond to what you really want to be doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um. Oh, actually, we have a question right back there. Is that okay if we? Mm -hmm. It is cool that we made formal verification a buzzword, though. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess uh, I just have something to add on to that because that there's almost like, I think, kind of a third layer in addition to like theoretical security of the protocol and then making sure the implementation corresponds to it, which is just kind of extra attack vectors that come from doing computation in the real world, mm. like side channel attacks and also power analysis. But don't you feel like, uh, like there are systems set up to look for that, right? Did those not fit in the first in the theoretical, like thinking about the side channel? Uh, not, not usually in, like, academic papers, okay. or at least the ones I've been reading. All right. Well, I like your opinion. You can come up, <laughs> and take over that. Yeah, that seat. So now you you have a. You kind of getting how it works, right? You can ask a question, you can make a comment. So as we talk about applications of zero knowledge proofs, uh, I hear a lot of talk about blockchain and guilty as charged, but uh, what are some of the other applications of zero knowledge proofs that are actually becoming practical now that we should be talking about and uh, some food for thought? Uh, 
national identity cards as things like real ID get rolled out, uh, your international mobile subscriber identity, which can be used to track your location at any uh, cellular operator you associate with. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a question. Good. Do you have some thoughts? Um, I'm not sure that having some kind of zero knowledge system helps with like uh, you know a national identity or like an uh, an MC or something. Um, I think that that effectively just amounts to kind of like privacy washing, uh, an, a bad thing. Do you have any thoughts, either of you? You can say something. Are you too tired? I'm <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm a bit skeptical whether, whether ZKPs in their more complex forms are ready for those kinds of applications at this point. Because, I mean, for one, computational overhead, but also things like who actually, like how many people have the knowledge to do this work? Like, right, like you, you can easily hire somebody that can, you know, write some, I don't know, big data analysis pipeline using Hadoop and Java or whatever. But like now do the same thing with zero knowledge proofs. How many people are there even in the world that you could hire to do this job for you? And then like, what would your security property with regard to the society that's trusting in this be? Because they would at the end of the day very much rely on some sort of social proof, right? Where, where some expert says the system works. Um, and at that point, is it from a society perspective that different from having having some sort of law that forbids the company from doing bad things with the data? I don't know. You At have this point, in the future, maybe not. So just like one more kind of, you know, to maybe think through, like with a question that, you know, suppose that all of this zero knowledge proof technology was like very ready and very, you know, deployable and everything, and then you could, in theory, build some kind of very privacy preserving like national identity system and then like roll that out to every uh, aspect of people interacting with each other like would that actually be good and I think the answer is no <laughs> like it is good that like when I go to the store I can just like hand someone cash and they don't need to like verify my citizenship and I think that... Maybe here, but I think in Sweden, they're like going for cash free, right? Sh sure, and I, I think that's pretty evil, right? And, and I don't think... So, so that's kind of the, the, what I meant by like privacy washing. Like, it, suppose you could do that. Would it be good? Well, no. All right. Did you have a point or question or a comment? Hi. Uh, what do you value more in zero knowledge proofs? The um, scalability or the privacy or both hmm. and why? Uh, I mean, I think the cop out question to that is that we don't really need to value one aspect, uh, particularly more than the other, because uh, in most of these schemes, we don't need to trade off scalability to get better privacy. Hmm. Uh, but I think from a practical perspective, more recently there's been some exciting work on scalability. I think maybe a bit more than privacy, but. Can I guess your answer? <laughs> oh, really? Oh, tell us. Both. I mean, why not both? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Um, Tux has been very patiently waiting, thank you. Oh, like I've had several opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that a lot of people in the space, uh, specifically in privacy, or you know maybe more or less in zero knowledge, uh, and really cryptography in general too, I think, uh, a lot of people are more valuing applications and kind of losing sight of the end goal of like what a lot of cryptographic research and cryptography engineering is, is about and it is consent. Like we are building essentially consent-based systems that allow us to opt in with our own data or our information rather than you know, say, oh, like as Henry put it, privacy washing, where I can just, because I can encrypt something and share some information with somebody, doesn't mean that it's a good thing to do. It doesn't, you know, it, where the cool thing about cryptography is that there's a power asymmetry 
It's what I can agree to do and what mm. uh, I want to do in an application. So that way, I you know, I don't have to worry about somebody abusing my data, even if it's encrypted. I just want to know if I have the right to choose whether or not to engage. Cool. I think you're gonna take this spot. I think there's a question right here. Right. Yeah. So earlier was mentioned how complex these things are. I think in one of the talks there is how few people in the world understand these things. Um, but we are sort of deploying these things in practice in this blockchain space. I think Bulletproofs is what, maybe a year or so after it was uh, released. So are we moving too fast and should we be slowing down on actually deploying these things? Hmm. Is that a, like opinioned? Do you think it's okay? It's a question? Okay, it's a question. I got the jury. Almost. I think everybody <laughs> like not the easiest thing to understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that we're not really, I don't think we're going too fast in that if we kind of slow down and start trying to really standardize things, we might just end up with something that's suboptimal, like uh, only considering schemes using R1CS instead of the more recent uh, polynomial-based schemes. And that would be, right, it kind of goes back to uh, the question of how we can screw ourselves over for the next two <laughs> decades. <laughs> and we kind of want to avoid that. And like a, from like a business decision slash, you know, research perspective, I would say that like there's times when, it, when, it, when you know that there's like a, there's times to really push hard and go really quickly for a lot of this stuff, and I think now is that time. You know, projects will deploy things where we're, maybe we're not getting as much utilization as we would hope to have, but in the future maybe we want more. Um, like right now is the time to deploy, I think, stuff that we feel like is experimental to see what actually works and what doesn't work. You're incentivizing people to do more research and, you know, break stuff sometimes, and I think that's really important for the entire community to know what the practical applications are. So have people build on them and use them. Uh, build things that you know can fall apart, but you know with warnings and things like that. You know um, whether or not you build like mission critical applications on this stuff. That's like an ethics problem. I think that you know the implementers should probably consider before they work on it. Uh, but I think right now is the time to really move fast and and get that stuff out there, test it, and figure out what is going to work in the future. Question that came up during a discussion previously in the in the coffee break: uh, What's up with the zkp ASICs? Will we will we be seeing any of those anytime soon? Oh, um, yeah. Good question. ASICs. I don't know much on the hardware implementations of zkps. I think that would be really cool to find more of them. The uh, Zcash Foundation funded one, so um, that could be cool. I mean, I think it exists. I haven't personally tested it, um, but uh, because there, through a Zcash Foundation grant, there's now a, an FPGA implementation of BLS 12 381. Um, I have a question, is, that, is it good? Uh, no, ASICs, not the implementation. Or, like having these kinds of ASICs, is it, is it a good? So on the... So currently, uh, in Scaling Bitcoin, we saw a presentation of a scheme called Proof of Necessary Work by Akis Katis and Joseph Bono. And the idea is that you can do Nakamoto consensus where you're approving an ASIC and you're also grinding an ONCE. So if you deploy a good system that does Nakamoto consensus with SNARKs, uh, you directly incentivize the creation of uh, SNARK ASICs. So wow. this must happen. <laughs> That's an opinion. Do you want to yeah. say yeah. something before you jump off, though? Um, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of proof of work. But so wha what I'm saying is that like, if you're stuck with the work anyway, because you need to have the prover. Right, but I, I mean, instead of having proof of work, you could switch everybody over to proof of stake. And then could ASICs work. don't. Right. OK. <laughs> Georgios? So when. <laughs> uh, <laughs> When I read about um, the flaw in Zcash found by Ariel Gabizon, I wondered why didn't he just exploit it to get insanely rich? <laughs> and then I wondered, 
Maybe he did. <laughs> How would we know? <laughs> There's no and, Z cash and, here uh, in response to Do that. you think <laughs> it, that, that the possibility for someone to find a flaw in systems deployed today is, is a serious threat to those systems, and how do we deal with that? I think that's a good question. So, to summarize the question is, not a, is, do I find the threat that somebody can find serious flaws in the implementation today? Do I think that's a big threat? I mean, in general, yeah, of course. Like, uh, like finding uh, flaws in like a ton of uh, these, anything really can represent a huge threat. Specifically for cryptocurrency, I think it's a big deal because you know we can't really just redeploy it. You know, <laughs> it's, once it's out there, it's out there. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's I think it's worth people just kind of saying building resilient systems and and kind of including like. Okay, think about it. Put it in your threat model. When I'm when I'm engineering a, a system like this or a blockchain, even, you know, what can I do in the event that this may become an issue? And even if people say, "Oh, it's not an issue," unless you can provably say it's not an issue, I mean, there's still implementation flaws to and things like that where you know it may be an issue, even if it's not provably an issue. Um, so I would say I want more people to start thinking about these critical failures and how they are placed in their own threat models when they're building these applications and exactly what they can do after you know this critical failure, this incident, what can be done about it? And kind of assuring the public that using it today, and if this does happen, we have mitigations mm. in place. Yeah, because the question really is, is like, should you not deploy these things? It's like, should you, like at what point are they safe enough even if there are some sort of vulnerability? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, I, I think there's ethical, ethical questions to whether or not you should deploy or use them, but obviously it's an opt-in thing. Not everybody has to use Zcash. You know, not everybody has to use Monero or these, all these cryptocurrencies. Um, are they going to be adopted by world governments tomorrow? No. <laughs> you know? Uh, so I think it's an opt-in risk. As long as people do their due diligence and figure this stuff out, they should do it um, if they want to. But, yeah. So on the technical side, my understanding is that like there is a scheme by Madad Virza and uh, others like th that they call the ZK Sharks, which allows you to verify that like the setup was not compromised, even though the setup itself was not public coin. Uh, so maybe that can help like in the case where you don't trust Ariel like uh, getting all the money like and like dumping Zcash. Uh, firstly, that. Secondly, like I think that like the universal setup is obviously a good step forward for that reason. And thirdly, like so on the like getting people to like be able to evaluate this stuff, I have like a question on this, like for everybody. So okay, obviously, like being firstly to devise these protocols is a very valuable skill set and to understand these protocols. Implementing these protocols is an extremely valuable skill set. There is like a weird situation where like obviously because this is a very valuable skill set and like many people are like largely motivated by making money. Um, the, it creates a, a situation where why would I teach you how to do this if by you being able to do this, I'm going to make less money like if I were to sell my skill set to somebody else. So like com from a completely like, uh, like morally, whatever you want to phrase it way. So um, there needs to be some way like, uh, like some mass education of people like to somehow like get everybody up to speed like uh, up to this because the people that are like very selective about this, they won't teach you. Really? Like, they won't. I you I feel I like I you feel like there's a. Everybody's like so busy. Like all these people that like know how to do this, they're ridiculously busy, and nobody has ever sat down with me to teach me anything like that. So I don't know. Busy, I can agree with. Motivated to not teach people, I strongly no, no, no. Uh, disagree. Yeah. Pardon me, I did not mean to. <laughs> yeah. I did not mean by any way to Strad, say you can that. Come up. Yeah. yeah, like Take I'm, I'm not disputing. I'm not disputing that there can be motivations like that. Yeah. Um, but at least for the for the ecosystem that I have seen thus far, um, I I can't think, imagine anyone being less willing to to share knowledge. Because this if is n now this is a good community of good people. I, yeah. I would hope, uh, but you know, um, who knows how it will go? Oh yeah, it's it's uh. entirely. If this if this thi if this whole thing like blows up and like every major government let's say wants to like uh, do proof of concepts or whatever. 
Uh, the value of the skill set will go way up, and like uh, but people, the, the number of people uh, will people also grow. Uh, in it. <laughs> well, what if they scars? Yeah. Yeah. I, I also, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one thing that I think is interesting too is that you know, teaching people about these concepts is is important. I, you know, teaching them specifically about zero knowledge proofs and like literally the, the constructions of them. I'm not sure there's a value in, in teaching the entire broad society the mathematics behind zero knowledge proofs, but. Telling people that there are ways for them to achieve their own privacy to get what I was talking about, those designs where we're building consent into, into, into applications, when people start seeing the benefits of these kinds of applications, they're going to demand other people start using these. They won't know exactly how, it, how they work specifically, but they're going to say, I like, I prefer th this company does this thing, I'd rather use this thing when that, yeah. But I think that's, that's- But going back to this point, which is like more, <laughs> is like, is the education or the information at the heart of this actually wi withheld from people? I, I actually think it is to some degree. Where? Because so this, I. Well, <laughs> I, the, the interesting thing is, I you think that a lot, a lot of, a lot of cryptography is hidden behind a significant wall of academia, and it we've. In the political scene, we've seen this exact problem where we're talking more and more about political philosophy than we actually are practical implementations of like actually getting things done and actually enacting real change. So what I want to see is more people, you know, escaping this from academia and putting it, you know, more into the streets, if you will. Like, let's see, like a conference like, like making this. making it accessible. Yeah, a conference like this, making it accessible to more people street who crypto. don't have doctorates. Wait, do, do we want it yeah, to be too, is there, is, there a too, is there a point where it becomes too accessible though? I, no, I, I just, really? well maybe to some Where degree. like people could be implementing it willy nilly, making all sorts of problems. <laughs> yes, I mean, there, that, I, don't think, I don't think it would ever be a problem with somebody implementing too much of their own crypto, you know, obviously we have trust. We don't, you don't just go put in your credit card in some random website, despite everybody being able to kind of build their own, use Stripe and like start receiving payments, right? So I, I, I do think that there's a lot of cryptography that's hidden behind academia, academic language, mm. and papers are academic language. Ac language. Academic language. Like what do you think of I'm a high, I, I, hmm. I'm, okay, I'm a high school graduate. That's all I am. I dropped out after my first semester in college. Like teaching myself enough math to get to this point was difficult, you know. And we should actually be able to build more and more uh, infrastructure for people mm. who are like me or just anybody who's interested in cryptography to get to that point to actually implement, use it, and learn about it. And instead of hiding it behind this academic barrier of like, oh, you don't have a doctorate, you're not allowed. I think I, I forget the name of the conference. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like uh, it was like very fortunate for like I forget the name of the conference, but they required that like everybody would submit a blog post and a short video of like uh, how their paper worked. Um, I forget. Uh, maybe it was ACM. I don't know. But it was like very useful because you know like I don't, maybe I don't have the time or the expertise to read like through all your security proofs. So I kind of trust that your security proofs work because like you got in the tier one conference and you got stupid uh, reviewer to accept it. Um, but um, in the end, all I want to know is like, how can I possibly implement it, and like, what do I need to know about it? Like, there's no need for me like to root through the whole thing, through like very like uh, intimidating LaTeX or like uh, weird like proofs. There's yeah. a question right over here. Yeah, Been sure. Patiently waiting. Oh. Oh. Um, well, the point I was going to make was similar to what you've just raised was around the the incentivization. Of how of actually making it accessible because a lot of the traditional academic model is just you know you're you're, you're getting funding to do a very specific thing and you know they're not paying you to teach other people they're paying you to uh. do the research and it's something that is sort of an, an inherent failing I find of the mm. of of a lot of the like it gets it gets research done which is great but if you aren't if you're not within the the like PhD postdoc academic tr uh, track and the and the um, the strain that that imposes um, it does make it somewhat um, difficult to sort of uh, become an entry point there um, a similar one um, related is like you know reproducibility of things you know there, there's similar um, disincentivization dis around that because you know most conferences and um, publications won't publish like you know, oh, I did the same thing twice, and wow. I got the same answer. Yeah. Um, 
So, huh. yeah. The All right, we are, we're going to open Big shout up. out to the Merlin, Marlin authors, like, for their implementation and, like, giving the actual concrete numbers. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so question over here. Sure, thank you. So, um, just want to share that, that, that in, in, in my experience, I mean, I got a lot of help from, from, from the academia, like, especially UC Berkeley, and I saw Def in the audience. I don't think UC he's here Berkeley anymore. He's, like, top 0.1%. Yes, but they're super helpful. Talk talk to to Dev. He was he used to, he was here earlier. He's he's yeah. awesome. Um, Being able to have access to people from UC Berkeley, uh, at least to me, it has been a dream. Like, the, for example, like being literally like being able to speak with Ale like last week in Simon's like and just ask me anything, ask him anything. Like it was uh, for me, it's like uh, huge. Right. Or like being able to see Dan Bonet in person and say, hey, I'm a fan. Like. Uh, you know right. what I'm saying? Right. George, let's let him finish the question. <laughs> yeah. So my, my, my question is, is, is um, I do agree that, that, that a lot of like, the, the papers out there are, are, are by academics, of course, and, and for academics. So what's like, like, like for, for engineers the best um, uh, material out there to, to learn uh, about zero knowledge? That's such a good question. For engineers... My, the way I learned cryptography may not be the best way. But, you know, like you were saying, I wish I had a network of people that I could go out to and be like, help me understand this paper. Instead, it was literally, I read a paper, I get stuck in the, like, the introduction, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I need to go and find, I need to go read about this like, weird math thing. And I go on Wikipedia and I find, try to go through that. Oh, God, I have like four other things I need to learn about. And that was how I did it. I literally just kept reading it until I understood it. So for engineers who probably don't have that time, you know, it's, I, there's a lot of Slack groups, there's a lot of Telegram groups, there's a lot of people who are willing to help you in this space. Um, we need to make those people known, like you. Um, we need to be more open about groups where we can have these questions and discussions and where we can actually have like, you know, the no stupid question kind mm -hmm. of policy. And they need to come in here and, and help us figure it out. Like, Cryptography has been overwhelmingly dominated by this thing that, you know, don't roll your own crypto, which is important, but at the same time has been extremely xenophobic to any new, any new people. And demotivating for and some engineers. Very demotivating, yeah. We covered that in the last I, podcast, actually. I, I remember the, the first library that I tried implementing, and that sort of specter of my head was very uh, prominent. Like, you know, I was... I really didn't feel that I was supposed to be doing this, but no one else exactly was. Exactly what I was too. Yeah, um, I think in the like in the long term, I think you know. So there's absolutely a need to sort of like get more um, FaceTime with people, get and get more. Um, yeah, get more. If more people know about it, then more people can learn about it because there's fewer contended resources to be able to learn. So like the busiest thing we came back to. Um, but there's also sort of like a, a layering thing because like you think of modern um, engineering, you know, um, software engineering at the moment. You know, how many people actually on a day-to-day -day basis have to care about how a compiler works? Not that many. Um, for the most part, there's reasonably good abstractions away from most of this stuff. And we, we're not there yet with, um, with ZKPs, but it is somewhere that we can absolutely get to. Mm -hmm. um, and when we have more of that sort of tooling available, it's and you know some of the good work that's being done on like you know Snarky and Socrates and these other sort of like DSLs that are working to like abstract over some of the bits that a lot of people shouldn't need to care about. Um, it's going to make getting and actually using these for for like your your everyday engineer who just is trying to write that web page that ha for some reason needs a ZKP to talk to the server. Um, yeah, it's going to make their life so much easier. Um, and if we get to that point, then I sincerely hope we learn from the lessons of the compiler errors where we actually, you know, we do actually try and document what's going on inside them. So if you do want to learn, you have, you know, that's another avenue because then mm -hmm. it's, it's canonicalized knowledge in a, in a sense. Like, you know, at, at ECC, you know, I, I sometimes use the quip that um, Sean is our compiler and Dara is our dash 01 flag. <laughs> Um, and that's not scalable. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, we need to get to the point where, where this stuff is sort of like canonicalized and more widely usable and, and automated there's as well. It, there's a question actually right here. Uh, I don't have a question. I have an opinion oh. that uh, 
in academia, like there is a trusted setup that is of peer reviews, uh, peers. So peers know how to separate uh, complex stuff from, or like just to say like what is bullshit and what is not. So like peer reviews are uh, not public. Mm. So I mean like uh, I, I feel that like at least the ex at least the papers that are accepted in major conferences should have uh, like maybe like uh, these reviews blinded and published so that like you can like sort of have a more information and more like dialogue around that is my See, I opinion. think that's an interesting opinion. I think you're taking this seat. And I actually want to ask that question ag kind of again, because like, yeah, I think you're taking this one. Uh, peer review, like generally as a topic, is something I've become, like in this space, with all of this explosion of new stuff coming out, is it being peer reviewed? <laughs> and how is it being peer reviewed? And at what point should a company, and this is actually, people have asked me this question, like what, not that I'm the person to answer, but at what point should a company use one of these implementations and go with it? Because there's so much coming out so quickly that there's this sense like, I'm gonna wait and see till something stabilizes, but at what point should they jump in? And like, yeah, how is it being reviewed? So for peer review, like, Growth 16 was at AsiaCrypt, right? So I think it was AsiaCrypt, uh, which is like a pretty like good conference, like yeah. as good as it gets. Um, uh, like the new papers, they're at like ePrint, but I expect that they will like be submitted like to one of the, I don't know, Alan, like did you, are you guys going to submit it to somewhere, like probably. Uh, so I think that like for peer review, like it is important, but like how many people exist that are able to peer review yeah. it? Odds are, uh, odds are that like a, like there's a good overlap between the five papers that get submitted, let's say on September. Like uh, the people that submitted them, like uh, like they might end up like being reviewing like their own paper, like so to say, like because they're so few. So few. So it gets back to the education like loop. But like uh, as more people like learn about it, more people will be able to peer review it, and uh, maybe they will be able to do informal peer review or like the actual like conference. Do you like have any thoughts on review. that? Um, as as one of the co-authors on one of the recent papers that has is just ePrint has zero peer review, I would say generally try and avoid um, if if you you know if you are trying to look for something that's established, yeah maybe don't just take a random paper off ePrint and and implement it. Also, as someone who has taken random papers off ePrint and implemented them, <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah like. So I, you know, I can speak a little to you know, what we did because um, obviously um, you know, I work for Electric Coin Company. Hi, probably obvious. Um, with with Sprout, we were taking an established paper that had been that had gone through review and published and all that. Um, with with Sapling, that was very much an engineering um, effort on top of that, and there was a lot of sort of new stuff going on with with this. Um, and as a result, because we never had like a a, um, a paper that got published to do that. Um, what we instead uh, came up with was, you know, created was a protocol specification that was very um, specific, as specific as we could make it. Mm -hmm. And then we spent a lot of time and a lot of money on audits. Oh, you did audits as yeah. your peer review. Yeah. Um, es essentially, yes. We mm -hmm. also got significant feedback from uh, from academics that we that we had um, you know, that we were talking with. Mm -hmm. um, it did not go through, however, an academic peer review process. Mm. So that's not to say that that like academic peer review is the only thing um, that matters in the space with these yeah. constructs. Um, but it is something that you should at least be um, you know, getting getting input from. Like, so that's interesting because that sort of falls in that category, like <coughs> audit as review. It's like a form yeah, of review. Cause, well, I mean, the thing with an auditor, of course, is like, you know, they are trying to, you know, Break bootstrap it. into a new system, you know, within like three weeks that you've oh, spent yeah. a year designing. So there's there's pitfalls to that as well. Yeah. You know, the no, thi nothing's the perfect. The thing is, in these situations, like, the auditor, like, you're paying the auditor to consult with you to, like, find the problems in your stuff. What ends up happening is you're consulting with the auditor to explain to them how your stuff works for like half of the time. Mm. And like uh, this is like a, like a usually a big problem. Like for yeah. example, like I designed like layer off chain like scaling systems. Like anytime I had to speak with somebody like to evaluate uh, my stuff, like you know, you have to explain the full thing like uh, for much longer time than uh, like is required because like then um, it's not like part, it's a very specialized skill set. Mm. 
but you, you have the same thing in an academic paper as well. I mean, you know, you've, you've written a paper. In theory, the paper explains what's going on, but in practice, a lot of the papers will assume some background knowledge or assume a fair bit, you know, because they're, you know, they're working under page limits, restrictions or whatever. And, you know, you do have similar um, issues with constraints and things. You have the, you know, peer, the, the reviewer and response process that essentially is a similar thing. There's a question right here. I totally agree that peer review is terrible. The state of the system oh. is terrible. We have academics writing papers not to to optimize the presentation of new science, but to optimize passing the gatekeepers. And we should find a, another economic incentive system to have a proper peer review. And as a company, I would not require peer review as a criterion to deploy something. Well, but that's two points. That's so interesting. So you would, peer review is bad, but you yeah. wouldn't require peer review. The quality of peer review ah. varies. Uh, oftentimes academics have far too little time okay. to review far too many Georgius. papers and yeah. don't end up reading them in detail. So okay. peer review doesn't give you a, a big guarantee of soundness to begin with. It, it does uh, filter out the 10% worst papers. Okay, you're up. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's, it's a risk assessment. So, you know, it's oh, up yeah. to each individual company uh, to go I, back I, to the I definitely want to add some comments to what Alan said, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. peer review is far from perfect, okay? But that doesn't mean that we should go ignore peer review, right? It means that I mean, there's also test of time. Cryptography, whether it's in academia, whether it's in industry, these aren't the questions. There's no academic barrier. That is not the issue here. It's that cryptography is an area of mathematics. And mathematics has always had a strict language, strict definitions, strict ways of analyzing things to minimize confusion in order to get everyone who's reviewing a concept on the same page to be able to come to the same conclusion and agree that they're agreeing about the same thing. So whether you're an academic or an industry professional or whatever you are, to say that we shouldn't have to learn a strict language that has been developed in a field in order to participate in the advancement of that is just blatant ign it's ignorance of the way mathematics works, right? right? It's not about academics versus industry. And I think what's, what you're seeing now, though, which is beautiful, is that there are people who are contributing new ideas to constructions and then collaborating with people who are perhaps more familiar with the, the language. formalism of the language and they're working together in order to then write papers that it gets submitted to conferences. And this is not to say that conferences are a perfect process, but they're one process. And probably we should not be just implementing things that were accepted to the top tier conferences, but waiting for a few years before implementing them. Yeah. That's test of time. All right, you're get, you get the strat spot. Oh, but is that yeah, so you have to come that sit here. That is I don't know if you opinion. know how this works. <laughs> 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 if, you may, if you say an opinion, you come up. Yeah. And then you can answer Good questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, just, I completely agree with Ben. Like, there are some academics here, and I would just like to ask one question is, how many of you, like amongst the last 10 papers you reviewed, how many of you actually reviewed the proofs in appendices? And Ooh. Because I have reviewed some paper, and nobody really looks at those. You already assume those. As, you don't have time to do that. Yeah. And so you already uh, assume those as correct. Yeah. So I think uh, my okay. original That's argument was uh, like pe peer review is very important, but like outside the academic community, peer review is uh, for the outside community. Peer review is objective process that you know that something has accepted into this big conference. It is good, but you don't know. Uh, like that's what I'm saying. Like somehow, like blindly make uh, reviews public and like let like people have a discussion on top of that. That was uh, my original uh, opinion. So I don't know. Uh, I think that's a, a good way to go because it doesn't like sort of break anything. Like it's just moving from uh, just a objective th thing to a subjective thing where like because. Uh, Peers have a better idea of like uh, separating what is like core idea behind the paper versus uh, uh, like uh, like they can separate like they can understand that language better. So mm -hmm. like their reviews have more meaning than uh, I would say a normal person who's reading the paper for the first time is not familiar with the language. I think Alan had a point there. Uh, in answer to your question, 
I don't always read the proofs. Um, <laughs> sometimes the, the theorem is trivially true, and, and I, I can figure out how the proof is going to work before even reading the proof, so why bother? And sometimes the theorem is trivially false, and then I do just enough work to prove that, prove that it is false. Oh. Um, so it, it really depends on, on the paper. Oh, so wait, somebody else has the mic, but do you want to respond to that? Most yeah. of the time. <laughs> <laughs> There's other conversations happening here. Hold on, guys, guys. There's the reviewers are rarely required to read the appendices. So if a paper has been published, even at a top tier conference, there is no guarantee at all about the appendices. Ben, do you have any thoughts on that question? Wha uh, I mean, wha so it, it is true that, that the append proofs and appendices are not always read. Um, and I think it just goes to, to my earlier point, which is just because a paper's been accepted to a conference does not mean it doesn't have mistakes in it, right? I think that um, you know perhaps one of the issues is that papers being submitted to conferences these days are too long, they have too much in them, reviewers aren't given proper incentive or enough time to review. Uh, maybe there's something that needs to be fixed about the, the, you know, the, the venues for papers, yeah. specifically in cryptography. Um, maybe it's not a rigorous enough peer review process. Um, you know, there's also journal papers and, and conference papers. So papers that have been accepted to a conference have not undergone the same rigorous um, journal. process that, that is required to be accepted to a journal. In fact, usually things that are submitted and accepted to journals, that's after they've already been accepted to a conference and more time has passed and people cool. agree on the result. Um, but uh, just, I guess, one more thing on this is that if if, and I think Alan touched on this, if papers are written, the main, e even if you don't get to the proof, but the paper is written using um, modular concepts that make it very clear to the reader what's going on. And so if there's more of a focus on like methodology for building proof systems and using a common language, then actually sometimes the reviewer doesn't really need to look in the appendix too carefully because the proof pops out. Right. If sometimes if it's intuitive to the reader how the proof would work, it also makes it much easier to then peer into the appendix and see that it matches their intuition. Mm -hmm. So there's another reason not to write monolithic constructions and then give a big proof of security, but to have a way of describing constructions that makes it easier to review. Okay. We have we're getting close to the end, by the way, folks, but So your your point that you talked about mathematics as a language. I don't disagree. Mathematics is a very elegant and very beautiful language in that it does have very strong definitions um, and that you know that we just can't drop in and just say, oh, this is what that is, you know. Mm -hmm. My problem with it comes from the same problem that I have with a lot of pol politicians and political activists and you know in, in the space for this, is that and uh, that we've also I think identified with this and is that Academics are now using their language, which is purely academic. You can't disagree that it's not purely academic. Mathematics is a purely academic language. It's not a language that every person understands. Um, they're hiding their ideas behind it and putting them specifically for a reviewer. Uh, like, as you just pointed out now, it's easier for a reviewer to review modular concepts instead of a monolithic concept in many ways. Mm -hmm. This is true. but. I'm not a reviewer. I've never, I've never reviewed a paper. I mean, I have my own, my own thoughts, and, and but I've never gone to that paper right, that per, the author and said, "Oh, this is weird." You know, they don't want to listen to me, to be honest. Um, but uh, my, my point is, is that a lot of these concepts are now being hidden behind this academic language of mathematics. The person who's implementing it oftentimes doesn't care the, about the definitions of what you know some of these symbols are and whether they exact what they mean. They just want to get something implemented, and that the implementer for and when we're talking about applied cryptography, like zero knowledge proofs, mm -hmm. in many ways, are your t your target is not the reviewer, as you pointed out. The review is not that incredibly valuable in, to some degree, and so now we need to be targeting the implementer, not the reviewers. This is not we should be avoiding academic language. We should be avoiding 
really weird mathematical constructs just because they make more sense to you know some doctoral student somewhere who spent three or four years studying that really one specific thing that they know about more than everybody else. We need to be writing papers yeah. for people who will implement them, for people who are going to try to teach other people how it works so we can find out ways if they actually work or not. Because it's not going to be wow. stopped in review. All right. Uh, All right so <laughs> you're uh, supposed to take this spot. Yeah, I feel and like I actually, but I think this is probably the last point, and I'm happy to hear what you, wa if you want to respond, but maybe you want to say something first. I feel like it's not like uh, onus of, uh, uh, on the onus of like a researcher to uh, like really, really like make sure that it is like publicly. Uh, understandable to the uh, even the person who haven't done uh, enough uh, like are not up to the same ground level so it's not their completely their responsibility so like there would be middlemen that will be responsible for like digesting that content and uh, in a better way so that they can provide better specifications because if you if you from the scratch if you start like uh, from the top down if you like directly try to make it like consumable to everyone then like you lose out on like the specification you want to put forward uh, and so i feel like th th there has to be like it's not sole responsibility of uh, like uh, researchers to, to give out give out like uh, everything that they are working on in a way that like uh, like Every, like it's not a newspaper, I, say, I feel that. Got it. The, the Pass that on, and you take the seat, and you wanted to say something first. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, d I don't know if maybe it, it was slightly misinterpreted, but I think w what we were saying is that the review, the review process isn't, isn't useless. It's just it's not as good as it, as it could be. Mm. And the answer is definitely not to just make it accessible for the implementer rather than a reviewer. And by the way, a reviewer is not someone specific, it's someone who speaks the same language, right? There is, there is a, if we're speaking different languages, if we're speaking Chinese and English, I mean, we have to come up with a language so that we can communicate, right? And so cryptography been has been written in such a way that there is a language to try and argue that things are secure and anyone who wants to participate in trying to analyze and whether something is a secure construction or not, I think should learn that language. So is that it the communicate. best language right now? If, in fact, if you have ideas of how the language can be improved, that is amazing research to do. And foundational cryptography studies, how do you come up with new languages that are better than, if you talk to Uli Mara, for example, from, uh, <coughs> from ETH, he says that our, you know, the current models we use are totally non-intuitive, and we should use different models for analyzing things. He calls it constructive cryptography. There's is that, also is that better for implementers? Is that also taking uh, that in yeah, mind? I'm not an expert on this, but I'm saying that there are, there are cryptographers who who wor who spend their careers working on just coming up with the right language to write protocols and, and argue their security, and that like it's a, it's a big part of cryptography, in fact. I see, I would, and I, yeah. I, I agree with that. I think that's great that we can actually have research done in actually improving the language that we communicate cryptography mm -hmm. in. Yeah. My, my more concern with having this using, when I say hiding behind an academic language, and mm -hmm. like you both agree, mathematics is purely an academic language. It is not, it, everybody here must agree with that. It is purely an academic I language. Don't, I don't know exactly what the distinction is that you're making between academics or industry or... Uh, no, I'm not making a distinction between yeah. industry, but the point is that you've gone through the academic process mm -hmm. to learn that language. For someone like me, I couldn't afford to learn the language. No, most people my age can't afford to learn the language, and I'm not willing to go into debt to learn that language. Uh -huh. So compared to like other, play, other countries and things where you know, maybe they have the resources I, for I it, it's quite privileged and mm -hmm. exclusionary to assume that everybody who will be in that research field is going to get to that point. And as you pointed out, uh, Th you know. There's actually, a, so there's a lot of material that is available and online. And a lot of the cryptography that I learned even as a student of cryptography was from reading papers, from reading uh, online instructionals that are made available. If you want to learn, for example, about, about um, zero knowledge, there were a few, uh, um, they're called the Winters, Barilan Winter School workshops. They're pretty good, they're right. accessible. Um, Dan and I are teaching a course for undergraduates um, that's going to that's on blockchains and cryptocurrency. We'll Again, cover snarks, we'll for undergraduates. Oh, you're talking okay. when you get but higher levels. I'm saying, but th like, there's also like no, MOOCs, and again, it's like if you t if you take a course, if you if you use online material to first take a course in cryptography or first take a basic course in computer science, 
then you can and then you can go understand a lecture or a course on snarks it's like because of the the proliferation of online material it does make it cheaper and more accessible for people to learn it but it doesn't say that people shouldn't shouldn't go through the process of learning a language in order to participate in it and I think you're, you're right. Education would be broken if it's only you can only access it through money. And that's why it's great that we have online educational material now. Yeah. It sounds like the undergrad situation is, is good, and those higher graduate levels maybe are less good, but that doesn't mean that they have to stay that way. And right. I'm going to have to actually wrap this up <laughs> because we are at time. But I want to say thank you to all of our participants in the Park Bench panel. Thanks for coming along. And thank you so much for, the, for coming to the summit. I think there's still a little bit of drinks. There might be some drink tickets. Please enjoy them. Oh, aw. And, and let's not forget to thank Anna. Oh. Thanks. Thank you.